Off, I wanted to reiterate that we, we started this uh, webinar series as a way to uh, try to address the near-term priority of Task Team 3 to uh, advance our understanding of uh, freshwater feedbacks on AMOC variability. We've had th uh, two seminars so far. It's been very stimulating. Uh, GoCon will give the third, and we really need volunteers to keep this going. So if, if, uh, if nobody volunteers, then uh, this will end and uh, all of the exchange that's happening uh, will come to an end. So please uh, get in touch with me via email or at the end of this talk if, uh, if you'd like to present some of your work. Thanks. Shall I go ahead, Kristen? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So uh, as the, you hopefully see my title, uh, as the title indicates, I'll be talking about robust and non-robust aspects of AMOC uh, variability and mechanisms in the Community Earth System Model, uh, CESM. This is a joint work with Steve and uh, Laura uh, from NCAR. I should mention that I actually presented uh, some uh, bits and pieces of this work in the September, I think September 2014, uh, almost uh, more than a year and a half ago. And uh, because of my time commitments and all that stuff, I could not essentially come back and finish and write this up. So uh, Laura, Steve, and I are in the process of writing this up. So uh, if you have any comments, uh, they'll be greatly appreciated. Uh, so the goal is essentially of this work was uh, to look at AMOC variability and mechanisms within a single uh, modeling framework. Uh, so far, I mean, you've seen it in the literature, there are many coupled simulations, and they all show various degrees of quite rich AMOC uh, variability. But the time scale of variability and mechanisms differ quite substantially among them. Uh, they essentially represent uh, multi-model uh, frameworks, essentially showing different AMOC variability characteristics. And I included two examples of that in the bottom uh, plot. They show uh, a maximum AMOC uh, time series. The left is the GFDLCM21. It has a very uh, more or less regular 20-year uh, oscillation. On the right side, there are two uh, time series of AMOC. Uh, these are coming from not CESM, but the previous versions of the uh, CCSM, CCSM4 and CCSM3. You can see in the lower uh, time series, CCSM3 had a very regular oscillatory behavior uh, for like a 300-year period between years 150 and 450, roughly and it actually disappeared, that regularity, after that. And in CCSM4, uh, the amplitude of uh, variability uh, was much reduced compared to CCSM3, and uh, it has a really broad uh, spec uh, power spectra, and with the most of the power within the, well, I mean, the dominant uh, sort of low frequency variability is in the 50 to 200 year range. So there is quite a bit of uh, variability. So, uh, also, when uh, we were analyzing the CCSM uh, solutions, uh, we found out that uh, essentially changes in the subgrid scale parameterization in the model, in the ocean model, can actually change uh, Labrador Sea uh, uh, deep convection or density anomaly uh, characteristics that in turn impacts AMOC uh, variability. So uh, what I ended up doing is essentially I wanted to present a systematic uh, assessment of the impacts of several ocean model parameter, parameter choices, as well as atmospheric initial uh, condition perturbations on AMOC characteristics within a single modeling framework rather than uh, multiple uh, modeling frameworks, and try to figure out if there are any robust and non-robust, well, I guess, by contrast, elements of AMOC variability and mechanisms. So uh, what I did is uh, perform uh, several, close to 10, 600-year simulations, and I'll show that thing on the next uh, panel uh, slide, uh, with CESM. And in these experiments, especially the, uh, the sort of five experiments that are listed here, I'm changing certain parameter values within reason. And these are loosely uh, constrained uh, parameter choices. And I can essentially justify these changes 
uh, easily based on what's done in literature or based on uh, limited available observation. So for example, in one example, uh, in the first uh, experiment, I simply uh, changed the uh, internal background mixing that's used in the vertical mixing parametrization from 0 0.17 times 10 to minus 4 to 0 0.1 times 10 to minus 4 in meters squared per second. Another experiment, uh, I changed the sub scale mixing parametrization a length scale. This is essentially such an ad hoc uh, length scale. It is uh, scaling, uh, essentially, some of the scale processes that cannot be resolved in the, in the coarse resolution models from essentially the process models to the uh, grid scale of the coarse resolution model. So the guidance uh, from previous work that length scale, sh that length scale should be ordered 200 meters to 5 kilometers. And pretty much all the implementation of this mesoscale mixing parametrization is using what I chose before, like almost five, six years ago, five kilometers. And in this example uh, sensitivity experiment, I changed it to three kilometers, roughly 3.3. .3. Then I did two experiments with mesoscale mixing parametrization changes. In one, I simply increased the deep ocean mixing, only for, uh, both for isopicking and thickness. And another one, I reduced the upper ocean value from 3,000 to 2,000. In uh, CESM, we are using a buoyancy dependent uh, distribution. So that's essentially changing. Upper ocean values are larger than the deep values. So I played with both. And a fifth experiment changes the horizontal viscosity, uh, in, reduces it. And then I also uh, performed three additional experiments in which I'm just simply changing the uh, atmospheric initial conditions by perturbing the uh, potential temperature in the atmosphere restart files in, at round off level. So uh, this panel is just showing the schematic. We have the red line is the large ensemble simulation control pre-industrial simulation that we have that went for 2,200 years. That is the code base uh, that I used for this uh, purpose. And uh, I ignored the first 400 years or so because there are transients. And I started these perturbation experiments from year uh, 402 of the uh, control experiment red line. You can ignore the uh, green line there. There's another last millennium case, but uh, I'm not going to uh, focus on that. And then uh, I'll be showing annual mean output uh, for most of the fields. And uh, these are also AMOC 10-year uh, low-pass filtered. And for this purpose, uh, the chosen index is 45 degrees north. And the results are somewhat uh, dependent in its, their actual values. But characteristics uh, or differences among the cases uh, are very similar to what I'm going to present uh, here. So uh, just to give you an idea about the mean state, uh, this is showing, uh, I also uh, used the notation from the previous panel, by the way. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, I sort of labeled them shorthand, vertical mixing, sub scale mixing, so on. So this panel is now showing the differences in the mean state in AMOC with respect to the ensemble mean. We actually recently recreated this plot just uh, showing the control here, but the differences are pretty similar regardless of what reference you use. So you can see that most of the uh, changes that I uh, introduced uh, do not impact the AMOC mean state much. For example, if you look at the SM case here, that's the sub measure scale uh, mixing experiment here, yeah, the mean uh, change in the mean is very uh, small. The largest changes occur in the two experiments that I actually played with the uh, measure scale diffusivity uh, coefficient. And these are the bottom three are the ones uh, in which the atmospheric initial conditions were perturbed. So uh, I guess this, uh, the, the changes in the means are not uh, surprising or lack of uh, changes. But now if you look at the, essentially uh, one thing that I just threw in here is AMOC mean and standard deviation because there are some studies in literature indicating that uh, large, for example, in some models, a uh, larger AMOC mean actually comes with larger uh, variance or variability. And you can see here that that's not necessarily the case in CCSM uh, experiments. In fact, 
uh, I mean, they are all uh, given here. Uh, you, I can't really conclude uh, any uh, correlation or dependence of AMOC variability magnitude with the mean value of uh, AMOC. So this is uh, probably one of the more important plots. Uh, plots. It is showing the AMOC index uh, power spectra from all of these uh, simulations. And uh, dots are uh, showing 95% significance level. And the squares are at 90%. And the main message here is that uh, essentially, by changing uh, some loosely constrained parameters, one can change the dominant time scale of AMOC variability, at least in CESM simulations. For example, if you look at this uh, blue uh, line here, that was the uh, summative scale mixing experiment in which I just changed that ad hoc length scale. And uh, in this uh, experiment, and, uh, as I tried to stress, there is not much change in the mean of AMOC. However, you can see essentially a very dominant uh, signal in the AMOC variability. This is about 30 or 35 years uh, uh, variability. It's almost uh, an oscillatory behavior in this uh, measure. And another thing that uh, we have looked at is the relationship between the overflows, Nordic Sea overflows, and the AMOC transport and variability in particular. And just to remind everybody in uh, CESM uh, simulations in the ocean model, we are actually using an overflow parametrization that's based on reduced gravity, uh, reduced gravity uh, between the source regions and the interior of the ocean. And uh, so there's no way that we can essentially explicitly resolve all the uh, processes associated with the overflow. So that's what we are doing. And in uh, some other models, they actually either artificially deepen, uh, for example, the Denmark State or Ferro Bank Channel uh, overflow regions, or they make them wider so that essentially they can essentially take the source waters directly into the North Atlantic. And uh, so what this is showing again from all these experiments, the top is mean AMOC versus the total overflow strength. And perhaps you can argue that there might be a linear relationship in the mean. But if you look at the standard deviations, we are not seeing essentially any link, uh, direct link between uh, AMOC transport and the uh, AMOC transport variability versus the uh, overflow uh, variability in its standard deviation. Now, I'm going to look at the next panel is actually showing the lead lag relationships. This is probably more informative. So this is essentially now overflow product water uh, time series. When I say overflow product water time series, it's the sum of the both ferro bank channel, I believe. It, uh, I should be careful. I think this is just the Denmark Strait uh, overflow, uh, and then the AMOC uh, index time series. And you can see that in uh, this is consistent with our previous uh, simulations. We are seeing actually a lag relationship between AMOC transport and the overflows, but the overflows are not leading they are actually lagging uh, AMOC uh, maximum uh, transport. This is an important distinction in some models, uh, particularly, for example, Headley Center model, if you look at it, they uh, actually found the opposite relationship. Any changes in Nordic Sea overflows in that model actually translates into changes in the AMOC uh, strength. And one uh, reason, uh, I think, is related to their treatment of overflows. They actually artificially deepened uh, quite strongly, I believe, the Denmark state overflow. So whatever comes out from the Nordic seas directly go into the North Atlantic without necessarily going into the Labrador Sea region, and in turn has a more direct relationship uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the overturning circulation itself. In our simulations, I'm skipping all the analysis. We have done it in the previous publication. Steve led one of the papers. Uh, we showed that essentially uh, overflow waters in CESM uh, go into the Labrador Sea, uh, uh, deep Labrador Sea, that in turn, in turn essentially in inhibits uh, convection. It makes the Labrador Sea more stratified, deeper, denser overflow waters. So that changes the relationship between the overflows and the overturning circulation variability. So uh, 
this is one robust aspect of CESM simulation. Another thing that uh, we have looked at is essentially the relationship between AMOC uh, indices, in this case, again, the 45 degree north index, with various uh, other uh, sort of fields in the North Atlantic. And uh, these are essentially showing now the index correlations with AMOC index correlations with March mean boundary layer depth, that's the upper left panel. The lower left panel is the subpolar gyre transport. The upper right is the upper ocean uh, density. And then the lower uh, right is the North Atlantic oscillation uh, index correlation. And when I say essentially in the Labrador Sea, these are all for Labrador Sea region, except the NAO one. And if you can see the, there's an inset up there uh, showing the uh, Labrador Sea region, and there's a red box region uh, highlighting where this analysis was done. You can also, uh, the black lines in each case is the actual ensemble mean of all those experiments. And then the shading, uh, red or gray or blue shading, indicates the spread of all the remaining uh, simulations. So uh, this is essentially, uh, in a sense, from these simulations confirming uh, what we have found before in CESM simulation, as well as in many other uh, coupled simulations. What we see is essentially there is a leading role for the deepening of the uh, boundary layer depth that essentially goes hand in hand with the upper ocean uh, density. There is uh, an associated, actually, strengthening, negative correlation in the subpolar gyre is a strengthening of the subpolar gyre circulation. So another uh, thing uh, that we found that's also consistent with our previous work and in some other modeling studies as well, we are finding actually some kind of, some uh, leading role for the North Atlantic uh, oscillation. I should mention that uh, I have actually a bunch of analysis done uh, with many, many correlations, regressions, and trying to figure out the physical mechanism with NAO-related surface fluxes, and also further budget analysis of various components. And I'm not going to show you that uh, in this uh, short presentation, but they'll be included in the paper. Needless to say, uh, essentially, what the, the analysis shows is that NAO-related uh, surface buoyancy fluxes uh, are uh, leading essentially or uh, leading to uh, sort of uh, these uh, density uh, anomalies in this particular model. And it's a robust result from all of the nine or so uh, simulations. So the final plot that I wanted to show is this is found in many other models before. I mean, the boundary layer depth uh, sort of deepening associated with uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, positive density anomalies. But one uh, issue that comes up quite often, how these density anomalies come about, whether salinity dominates, whether temperature dominates. And if you look at uh, literature, depending upon the model, you'll see one claims salinity dominance and the other claims temperature uh, dominance. Now, we can essentially see what's going on because we have nine or so uh, experiments. So this one now, this panel shows, again, in the Labrador Sea upper ocean, uh, upper ocean region, density component regressions onto AMOC index. So the full density is in black here, and that's the same as the previous panel that I showed, but these are not each individual cases. Temperature contribution is given in blue, and salinity contribution is given uh, now in red here. So prior to an AMOC intensification, you can see uh, that depending upon uh, the parameter choices that we essentially uh, use in the ocean model, uh, for example, this case, this is the large ensemble control, is showing uh, temperature dominance, but there is some non-negligible contribution from salinity. In contrast, the vertical uh, mixing scheme change is essentially showing that the density change is completely dominated by temperature or due to temperature. If you look at the submetal scale case, it is actually 50-50 almost. You can see contributions from both temperature and salinity. And this is consistent with, actually, I mean, I actually went ahead and looked at the individual budgets in the upper ocean. And depending upon what kind of 
parameter value you use in some middle scale, I can change the dominance of temperature or salinity uh, in this budget. And you can see other examples here too. For example, in the NVO case, you can see salinity dominance. So one result that comes out uh, from here is that uh, the whether uh, essentially temperature or salinity is dominating the uh, intensification of density is completely essentially, in this case, dependent upon uh, some loosely constrained parameter choices, uh, in this case, within the ocean model. But one thing that's actually quite robust, if you look at the, what happens after lag zero, you can see in all of the cases, essentially, decrease in density, that's the black line here, is associated with the warmer uh, temperatures pretty much, well, not pretty much, I believe in all of the uh, cases. Temperature and salinity are opposing each other, but the uh, temperature is actually dominating uh, the subsequent weakening uh, of the positive density anomalies. So with that, uh, I will uh, up and then put the summary and conclusions. So both the amplitudes and time scale of AMOC variability uh, differ considerably among the experiments, with dominant time scales of uh, variability ranging from decadal to uh, centennial. And there are large differences in the details of how the density anomalies leading to AMOC changes come about. But uh, I think uh, there are uh, really some robust elements as well, at least in CVSM simulations. The Labrador Sea is the key region with upper ocean density and boundary layer anomalies uh, preceding AMOC. Uh, we are finding actually this is another robust result, at least for CVSM simulations. We have found this in now uh, many versions of CVSM. Uh, enhanced Nordic Sea overflows do not lead to an increase in uh, AMOC maximum uh, transport. I should rephrase this thing actually maybe in a careful way. It's actually I'm referring to the variability here. Uh, number three is uh, after AMOC intensification, uh, subsequent weakening is due to advection of positive temperature anomalies into the model's deep water formation uh, region. Uh, and I didn't essentially uh, show you this, but the, the fourth bullet was essentially, I see persistent NAO plus uh, plays a significant role in setting up anomalies that lead to AMOC intensification, and that happens to you uh, via buoyancy, surface buoyancy fluxes. Uh, I, uh, my analysis that I'm not showing you here shows this thing, but if you notice, I did not say anything about uh, uh, definition of persistency here, it's unclear at this point how long that NAO positive uh, should occur. Should that positive anomaly be three years or 10 years? That's still uh, something to be uh, resolved. So with that, I'll uh, quit and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gopan, very much. Um, okay, we're going to go to Q&A. And uh, right before I take everyone off mute, let me give just a little guidance. Um, because we have over 15 people on the call, um, I'm going to ask that maybe you raise your hand before you speak and, and we'll kind of call on you so we can make this a little bit more facilitated. Uh, you can see a raise hand button in your screen. I'm going to go ahead and take everyone off mute. Feel free to mute your own phone or your headset um, to cut down a background noise. If I hear too much background noise, I'll try to filter out those few people, um, but I'm going to try to leave everyone off mute. And so, you're chomping on potato chips, hold up. <laughs> The conference has been unmuted. Okay, so I think I found the culprit and <laughs> that had some background noise. Um, so we're going to go to Q&A, Gokhan. Um, I know you can see hands raised as well, um, so I, I'll go ahead and call the people, but feel free to chime in as well. Um, I saw Paola uh, throw up her hand first, so Paola, go ahead. Yes, uh, can you show just for a second back that um Lag, the, the temperature and salinity, I think this was the next yeah, the this last is, slide. This one? Yeah, yeah. So one thing that I thought was quite interesting is that the, there's quite a difference in, so you talk about the, that, that the amplitude is, is in the, the contribution to buoyancy is different, but also the lag seems to yes. be different. Yes. And I, I think that one could generally say well, it's not always true, but most of the times the, the salinity uh, it's happening earlier, right? 
Uh, actually, that's a good point. I haven't uh, looked at it. Uh, yeah, in this case, that's true, that's true, that's true. Uh, that Did is you almost the same time. time? Oh, oh, yeah. Earlier, yeah. And this so is I almost think that, the that same. That might, kind of, might explain a little bit the difference. I mean, it's not the only thing that's going on, but, you know, that that might explain a little bit also the difference in... The cl you know, in the response in the climatology versus the va the variability. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. because on long time scale, so so the climatological state, you know, all time scales are involved, but especially the very very far away ones. And, and instead, for the variability, maybe the one that's shorter lag are more important. So, yeah. So I think it's quite quite interesting that. I mean, not that I have any ideas on <laughs> how this helps, but I yeah. thought that was quite striking, the difference. Right. Mm -hmm. I can take a look at that. I mean, we are actually looking at it in more detail as we write it, so I'll take a look at that point more carefully. Thanks, Paula. Cecile? Yes. I'm interested in your NAO results, please. And yes. um, the thing that kind of um, I notice is that if you uh, look at the uh, spectrum of the NAO, it's basically very flat and has very few uh, peaks in it, and mm -hmm. the decay time is something like a couple of weeks. So um, I was wondering, what does the spectrum in the model of the NAO look like compared with observations, and what is the resolution of the NAO that you're using in order to make this plot? And then I have a follow-up question. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't have all the answers for that, actually. These are based on the DJFM uh, uh, sea level pressure EOF1 anomaly, mm -hmm. and they are essentially DJFM annual uh, time scale. I believe you are correct that the NAO, I mean, that's the, that is the sort of the puzzling thing in all of these things. Although the NAO uh, spectra tend to be relatively flat, we tend to get these uh, kind of uh, relationships. And uh, the, I, I, I can't, I mean, I looked at them in detail, and I can't unfortunately remember for all the cases whether they show any significant peaks or not for individual cases. Well, the but you have a point, I think. That's, that's well taken. Well, I mean, if the variability of the NAO is very strong, even though it may not be persistent, yeah. you might get something like that. Yeah. And so uh, the follow-up question is, uh, have you looked as to see whether or not it's the variability versus the persistence that's actually uh, uh, giving rise to this kind of lead-lag relationship? Uh, I have not actually looked at this here. Did Steve, did Steve, did you look at these cases? Uh, did that question from these cases, do you know? Um, no. No, I did not. Well, one thing we found is that the NAO plays a very strong role simply as a stochastic term in, mm -hmm. um, on the uh, uh, much shorter time scales of SSTs in the uh, North Tropical Atlantic, and it can even affect uh, El Nino because the uh, uh, Bermuda High is the mm -hmm. southern branch of it. And so um, I'm wondering if that's a candidate that we should be looking for as a uh, stochastic uh, um, source yeah. of AMOC. Yeah. Now we can take a look at those certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cecile. Um, so uh, Zoli has a question, and, and then we'll go to Wilbur, and, and Zoli typed his in, so let me read that so everyone can hear, and then Gokhan, you can answer. Um, so Zoli writes, very interesting results. How deep do you go when calculating upper ocean density anomalies? Whether temperature or salinity dominates depends on whether you only average the layer that is in close contact equilibrium with the atmosphere, say 0 to 200 meters, or whether you go deeper 500 to 1,000 meters where TS temperature salinity anomalies have a chance of being evicted from further upstream, for example, the subtropical gyre? Right, that's a good question, actually. We, uh, these are uh, based on uh, upper uh, 200 and some uh, meter uh, averages. And not for this particular integration, but I've done it uh, down to 500 meters, from 0 to 500 meters, and the results are very consistent with this. 
uh, what's shown here. However, I have not done any uh, like intermediate depth analysis, 500 to 1,000 meter analysis. The reason I was uh, focusing mostly on the surface is essentially trying to connect it to buoyancy fluxes and deep water formation. So uh, that was the reason for the upper ocean uh, analysis. Great, thanks, Gokhan. Um, Wilbert, go ahead. Yes, I, 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 I too had this question about the uh, the the link with the NEO, and I think um, Cecile has covered that. I, I think she's thinking about the like maybe a mechanism that was described by by Sarah Vennon and Meg Williams or so, like a effective resonance mechanism. Stochastic resonance, uh, sorry, uh, spatial resonance, is that what it is? The yeah, with, with, with an effective um, aspect um, on it, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that uh, I think, uh, I, I don't think that I have looked at it in uh, comparison with what Sarah Vannon and Jim did but certainly we can take a look at uh, that in more detail. Okay, for, for the rest, I, I'm, I'm a bit fascinated that the, uh, the lead and lag times of these, uh, these, these correlation analysis are relatively a short, short time scale, basically maybe 10 years or so. And, and I'm right. just wondering how that relates to the 50-year the time scale of some of these oscillations that you, uh, that you, well, that you found. Th that's a very good question. I mean, in, in various DCSM4 simulations also, I tried to figure that thing out. Uh, the thing is that uh, we can find it. It is, it is not uh, necessarily oscillatory. It is variability. And uh, what is happening is essentially we can explain uh, essentially during that, let's say, 10 or 15 year time period, what can happen. And I also, I mean, these are not also event-based analysis either. So we can essentially, if certain conditions are satisfied, we can say that it is going to lead to such and such within this time frame, and then the reverse can happen within this uh, time frame shown here. But it is unclear how after that, for example, reduction of uh, density anomalies occur, the, 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 it is difficult to explain the time from that weakening of upper ocean density anomalies back to strengthening. That is the difficult part. And uh, as you said, the, the, the dominant variabilities are changing from uh, one model to another, and I don't have uh, a clear explanation for that time scale. Not for these integrations, but for the CCSM control integrations, uh, I tried to look at that explanation looking at advection, looking at wave propagation. It is, uh, it is not really uh, obvious. Right, right. Okay, thanks. I mean, one thinking is that uh, that's why I was stressing the persistent NAO. So somehow uh, there is essentially a NAO uh, events triggering uh, through surface fluxes, changes in AMOC, sorry, changes in density and then the uh, convection, and that's linking uh, to AMOC. And then the strengthening is occurring. Then you can essentially follow it, transports of salty and warm waters into northern high latitudes that in turn essentially feeds back into this plot uh, here, changes in the density anomaly. So we, I can track that much down, but it doesn't explain the full time state scale. So does it also hold for the negative NEO anomalies, sir? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, somebody asked, uh, else asked that question, and I don't have the answer. But presumably it should, but I haven't actually verified that. Right, OK, thank you. Great. Are there any other questions for Gokhan? Uh, Dong Zhao? Yeah, uh, Gokhan, um, uh, can you bring back the, the map about is the BMAC index uh, correlation with the BLD, which is the boundary layer depth, I guess? I guess. It's the mixed layer depth? This is the one, right? Yes. 
So uh, look at the, so the upper left little map. Does that show the mean mixed layer depth of the model or? Yes, that, sh that should, sorry, the, uh, no, I can't remember the, the, the no, these are, these are not showing the mean mixed, these are showing, the color shows the density anomalies uh -huh. And then the, there's actually black contours there. In here, those are showing the uh, boundary layer depth anomalies. Okay, I see. So the maximum boundary layer depth is still in the WRC rather than the Erminger C. That's right, that's right, yeah. I mean, I should have been clearer. In the in CSM simulations, the uh, pretty much uh, maximum boundary layer depth and the maximum variability of the boundary layer depth uh, are occurring in the Labrador Sea. Okay. A related question. I wonder if you see some uh, uh, lateral uh, change of the distribution, the mixed layer depth between Arminger Sea and the Labrador Sea. Uh, my memory is that not much. I mean, there are subtle, I mean, minimal changes in the mean boundary layer depth, and there are uh, there's some change in the variability, but in all of the variability plots that we looked at, Labrador C, it's very similar to what's shown uh, here. Okay. If I understood your correct, uh, question correctly. Yeah. 